By the mid-19th century, there was a growing body of evidence to suggest that evolution had occurred. In other words, that things had not always been the same as they are today. And one of the works that uh, helped with this was Hutton's observation that the Earth was really very, very old. Uh, the geology of the Earth, in other words, how long the Earth had been around wasn't thousands of years, but it was millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years. In other words, there had been enough time for change to have occurred in organisms. <clears throat> Lyle looked at the processes that were going on on the Earth today, volcanism, earthquakes, erosion, and suggested that these same processes must have occurred in the past and they were responsible for the formations that we see on the planet today. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck uh, proposed a theory of evolution and his theory was based on acquired traits being passed on from one generation to the next. For example, the bonsai is trained to grow very small in a pot and so if we save the seeds from that small tree and we plant them, its offspring should be very small. We know that's not true, but at least Lamarck had a theory, a theory that could be tested. Uh, Thomas Malthus pr produced a, a influential essay on population growth, human population growth. And in this, he suggested that humans could overpopulate very quickly, but they don't. And the reason they don't is because of war and famine and disease there were forces that kept the population in check. There was some type of competition. <clears throat> Charles Darwin took his uh, very influential voyage on the Beagle in the 1830s. And on this voyage, he was the ship's naturalist. The ship's mission was to map the coast of South America. And during this voyage, he collected a tremendous amount of biological material and also fossils and he made a great number of observations. He kept some very detailed notebooks and this was the basis for his work when he finally got back to England. Alfred uh, Wallace um, was working in Malaysia and he was noticing some of the same things that Darwin had been working on ever since he had gotten back from his voyage on the Beagle and he sent an essay to Darwin and in this essay he outlined how organism species could come about. In other words, how uh, the struggle for existence caused uh, new species to uh, appear. <clears throat> and this was so similar to Darwin's work that Darwin decided to go forward and publish his most famous work, uh, the one that's still utilized today and that's the uh, origin of the species. The origin of the species was published in 1859. It's uh, still read today. It's still the basis for our understanding of Darwinian evolution. And what I want to spend some time doing now is trying to explain what Darwin actually said in the origin of the species. Um, I can probably best illustrate this by looking at the finches of the Galapagos Islands. And Darwin collected these uh, finches. The Galapagos Islands are off the coast of Ecuador, the Pacific Ocean. And they're on a number of different islands. And each island have different uh, habitat. Some are uh, mountainous, some are more desert-like. And on these islands, uh, the finches look different. Uh, the birds look different. He, he didn't recognize that they were possibly all the same until he got back to England and he started to look more closely at these and anatomist zoologists actually looked at them and helped him with this. And also Captain Fitzroy of the Beagle had kept some very detailed notes on the geographic distribution of these birds and this helped Darwin to look at these birds a little bit differently. But what this illustrates is what uh, Darwin points out in the origin of the species. And uh, the first uh, premise is that there is variation in populations. In other words, in organisms, there's going to be a great deal of differences. Uh, we can see this in human beings. We can look at each other and we can recognize differences. Um, in any organism, there's variation. 
So that's the first premise. The, the second premise is that uh, all the offspring that they have don't survive. Some survive, uh, are favored in the environment, some do not survive. And <clears throat> what this leads to is uh, differential reproduction. In other words, those that survive, reproduce, and leave behind the most offspring are also going to uh, pass on those traits whatever variation they have that were favorable that allowed them to survive in that particular environment. So natural selection works on this uh, variation that exists within species. Darwin didn't know where this variation came from. Today we know it has to do with genes and genetics. Um, but Darwin didn't know this. He just knew that there was variation. And so his uh, hypothesis suggests that there is a common ancestor. And from this common ancestor, this ancestral finch on the coast of Ecuador, we have uh, descent with modification. In other words, the offspring uh, have traits that are favorable, and those traits are going to be passed on to the uh, next generation. And what this will eventually lead to is speciation. And so on the Galapagos Islands, we have over a dozen different kinds of uh, finch, which are all related to an ancestral finch from the coast. So some are vegetarians that feed in the trees, some uh, feed on insects, um, they're, they're different sizes. It, it's something in ecology people would call resource partitioning where they're uh, utilizing different parts of the environment to acquire their food. But what this leads to is it leads to uh, specialization uh, because of the variations that they have. Eventually they don't reproduce with each other eventually you end up with new species which are completely different. And this is what the origin of the species says. It says that um, organisms, uh, new organisms are produced in nature. Now Darwin was really brilliant. Um, in his theory of evolution, uh, what he had done is he had taken information from uh, biogeography, he had taken information from geology, in other words, fossil record, uh, the age of the earth, he had taken information from anatomy, and he had reconciled all this information and turned it uh, into a hypothesis that made sense, that utilized all of this information. And this is the genesis for the theory of evolution via natural selection. The way that evolution occurs, uh, according to this, the mechanism that Darwin described is natural selection. Natural selection is those that are most fit for the environment will leave behind the most offspring. It doesn't necessarily mean the fastest, the strongest, the smartest, just those that uh, are able to leave behind the, the most offspring in that environment that are favored in one way or another. <clears throat> He explained this so well. Um, he wrote 25 books, over uh, 20,000 pages of papers, letters, and manuscripts, uh, that there was just an overwhelming amount of information that he put out there to let people look at his idea and test his idea. From the voyage of the, the Beagle, he had so many uh, zoological specimens and botanical specimens that he was able to look at a, a great number of anatomical examples. And these anatomical examples were published in the Voyage of the Beagle, along with many of his uh, geologic and geographic observations. Uh, he wrote a book uh, to popularize, or for the general public, on the Voyage of the Beagle. Uh, he was the first to uh, be able to describe how coral atolls actually form. And in this he noticed that the island would erode away, the volcanic island, and around the perimeter of this island, this coral reef that had started to develop, eventually as the island completely eroded away, the coral reef kept growing because coral reefs are living. And you end up with an atoll. He was the first to describe this. He made geological observations in South America. He, he noticed that he witnessed an earthquake. This earthquake lifted the uh, seafloor several uh, feet so that it was high and dry, so the mussels and the barnacles were no longer in the ocean. And from this he was able to uh, think about, well, after immense amounts of time, could this not actually put the seashells at the tops of mountains? Because indeed we do find evidence at the tops of the Himalayas and the mountains that 
these were once at the bottom of the seafloor, and how does this happen? Well, these earthquakes, and he witnessed one, uh, helped him to understand this and how the continents had actually changed. He wrote a monograph on barnacles. This monograph on barnacles, that's what this species is, um, was relevant in the day, in the day of wooden ships. Barnacles would eat holes in ships, and so he was doing something you know, for the good of country, and, um, but he was also doing uh, this to uh, learn as much as he could about zoology and, and what it took to really understand anatomy and describe an organism. Um, he, he spent a lot of time before he wrote The Origin of the Species and published it. He collected many, many um, notebooks full of observations. He conducted his own experiments. And it took him over 20 years after he got back from the voyage of the Beagle before he was confident enough to come forward. And he came forward because of a number of number of things that were probably happening. One, he had collected all this data, but also because Alfred Russell Wallace was <clears throat> coming to the same conclusion. And at that point in time, Darwin thought that he could do this. He could, he could publish this work and put it out there. At first, this publication was hailed as brilliant. Um, there, of course, there were people that felt threatened by it, but in general, it was, from the very beginning, uh, a bestseller. Um, he went on to, to look at the fertilization of orchids. Uh, orchids have very specialized flowers, and these flowers are usually pollinated by a very specific organism, a very specific insect that's particular to that one type of orchid. Uh, flower structures usually have certain uh, animals that they attract in order to uh, make pollination happen and orchids are very, very specialized in this. And he wrote, he wrote about this. He kept a small uh, conservatory where he grew a lot of plants. Um, he looked at a very specific type of selection, and this is artificial selection, where instead of the environment selecting for the traits that would be passed on, man was uh, selecting for the traits. And we know that our domesticated animals uh, can be bred to be faster um, or larger, or to lay more eggs, we can make faster racehorses by breeding two fast racehorses together. And this is a, a selective pressure where we're creating, we're taking the variation that exists in the horse and we're creating a faster horse. Or we're taking the variation that exists in the chicken and we're making a chicken that will lay more eggs. Or the variation that exists in cattle and we breed the, the cows together that produce more milk until we have breeds of dairy cattle which produce vast amounts of milk. And so he recognized that this was an example of selection. It was artificial selection, um, very much like what nature does in the wild, natural selection. Inevitably, this led to the, the question of, well, where do humans fit into all this? And Darwin's explanation was very simple, that humans are not different from the rest of the, the creatures on the planet. We're subjected to the same uh, natural selection, the same evolution. And so he, he wrote extensively about the anatomical uh, differences between human beings and uh, the other creatures, and of course the great apes being most anatomically similar to humans. He didn't suggest that we descended from apes but he did suggest that there was possibly a common ancestor back there in some point in our past, and today we know that that is true, that there is a common ancestor. Um, he, he looked at behavior, he looked at emotions. In particular, he was looking at uh, the question of all the muscles in the human face that allow for expression of emotions and whether these muscles were actually in other creatures or not. Again, he, he did a lot of work with plants Later in his life, toward the end of his life, he, he wrote about his father, um, and he, he wrote about uh, the formation of soil. He explained evolution better than anybody. One of the um, interesting stories about Darwin has to do with his um, observations concerning an orchid, and this orchid is called um, today Darwin's orchid, it's a star orchid also. But this particular orchid has a very, very long nectary. The nectary is over 20 centimeters long, 24 centimeters long. And when he saw this orchid, 
uh, from Madagascar. He, <clears throat> he predicted that there would be uh, an animal that had a tongue that was long enough to actually take advantage of this nectary. Uh, this nectar is produced in plants to attract insects or animals to fertilize them or birds. And so he predicted that there must be uh, an insect or an animal that had a tongue, a proboscis, long enough to actually take advantage of this. And indeed, the Congo moth was found. A Congo moth has a, a proboscis that's over 20 centimeters long. It keeps it all rolled up. And in 1992, this was actually confirmed. Uh, there was a, a wildlife photographer that actually caught this on tape. So Darwin's orchid, um, this beautiful, beautiful orchid here, actually is pollinated by the Congo moth. Darwin was brilliant. Any way that we uh, look at his work, uh, he was ahead of his time, and we were lucky to actually have uh, his insight.